said, Madam Secretary, at 6 to 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, um, or Central Daylight Time, excuse me, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we'll call the meeting to order. The recording has started, and just in case anybody is wondering, we do uh, record these meetings, uh, and we do post them on YouTube after the fact, and it's probably going to be a week or so, so I'll have to edit it once I get back to the, uh, to the States. Um, Sean Parker has advised me he's not able to attend tonight. He didn't have anything specific that he wanted to cover. Uh, he's working on a few things for us and he'll update us um, as we go along. So that being said, we'll skip the council corner. Um, Sergeant Fisher, um, officially you are up. So the floor is yours, sir. All right, everybody hear me okay? Excellent. Uh, so as, as usual, I had the, the data analyst uh, in the precinct pull your, your stats for the last month. You guys had a total of 17 incidents. Um, I'll put my magic glasses on so I can actually read all these words. Uh, the, the most concerning was you had a personal robbery, 1400 block of Meridian Street. This one, uh, the victim was just sitting in his uh, vehicle. Suspects approached, uh, opened the door, pressed a handgun against his body, demanded his phone and wallet. And they got his phone and some cash and then fled on foot in the alleyway uh, right beside him. Then <clears throat> we had two aggravated assaults. Well, it's one incident, but it had two victims. This is the one over there on Montgomery Avenue where um, your victim in this case said they had some heated words with the suspect, which is a known suspect, uh, just before the incident. Uh, victim got home, parked his vehicle, then the suspect drove by and fired multiple gunshots at him. There was no injuries, um, luckily. Uh, but we've got the, the suspect's info, and the detectives are helping the victim with prosecution on that. Uh, there were two aggravated assaults that were domestic-related. One of them, the suspect was arrested on scene there in the 100 block of Meridian Court. Second one was uh, 1300 block of Jones Avenue. Again, it's domestic, so we know who the suspect is. Um, this one, the victim was stabbed in the hand with a knife by the suspect, but it was just a minor abrasion. It wasn't like uh, a piercing stab. Um, no knife was found. Uh, both subjects were very intoxicated, so the night court commissioner uh, refused to do prosecution on that one. Then there was uh, a commercial burglary at the El Matade uh, business there at 203 East Trinity. They forced entry through the uh, window, and right now it's under renovation, so the suspect stole miscellaneous tools on that one. Then you had two residential burglaries, one in the 1800 block of Joyce Circle. Suspect information is all unknown. Somebody came in through a garage door and stole uh, tools, miter saws and compressor. Then over on Ward Street, uh, back door was kicked in, some computers, um, were taken, but the victim in this case believes that it's possibly uh, an acquaintance that uh, may have perpetrated that one. Then when you get into thefts, um, package stolen off of a porch on Edwin Street, and the the typical category that's always the worst for every, every neighborhood in Davidson County, or in this region for that matter, you had five incidents of a theft from Via's uh, vehicle. Uh, one of them had forced entry, and then the others appeared that they were possibly unlocked or there was no evidence of forced entry. I, I do want to make this point. Uh, I can't remember if I said this at your last meeting. Um, you guys have heard me or the commander uh, say for years now about the, the park smart theory of if you keep your car locked up and no valuables in plain sight, it's very unlikely that uh, you're going to be a victim of this case. Overall data, not your data, because your data just said that one of those incidents was uh, forced entry. We're seeing a lot of cases across Nashville where the suspects are starting to bust out windows, even when there's nothing out in plain sight. They're busting out the windows to get in and rummage around. Uh, I've seen a couple of cases come across my desk where a victim uh, is saying, hey, this is like the second time in a matter of like a month or two that my window has been busted out and nothing was taken. Um, that being said, I'm getting a lot of questions coming in my office about, well, should I just leave uh, my car unlocked? I, I can't in uh, clear conscience, you know, 
being the police, say, yeah, leave your car unlocked. But what I can say and, and, and comfortably say from a data standpoint is we're seeing a lot of those cases. So if you make that personal choice to leave your car unlocked, I totally understand. I, it, being, being police or not, I don't want my window busted out. And when it comes to insurance, you, you're going to end up just having to pay for the window because your deductible is probably not going to supersede that. So I totally understand why people are asking that question. The point I want to just keep driving home is, one, please, please, please don't leave uh, spare keys in the car because so many of our vehicle thefts are a result of keys being left in a car. You get like a valet key in the glove box or whatnot. And, and like we said before, we think a lot of those vehicle thefts are a result of vehicle burglaries where they find a key when they get inside and go, oh, well, now we got a car. Um, so just looking at data, I think uh, if you're wanting to avoid being a victim of theft when it comes to vehicle burglaries and vehicle theft, as, as long as you're definitely keeping anything of value whatsoever out of your car, not just hidden, but out of the car completely, not even in the trunk, because once they get in the car, they can pop the trunk on most cars. Um, and if, if you choose to leave your car unlocked, we get it. I mean, we totally understand. Uh, and again, the last... Uh, Mike, does that include um, like all the registrations and the insurance and all that stuff you typically we carry in glove compartments? So every, every now and then we're seeing cases where they'll take uh, registration paperwork. But I was an auto theft detective for a couple of years way back and uh, you're not going to be able to do anything in that registration paper. So why they steal those things, I'm like, eh. Now, I will say this, and anytime this has ever happened in the past, I would, I'd just be shaking my head. If your vehicle is paid off, your title needs to be in a safe. Do not, do not, do not, do not leave your title in your car. And some, some folks will do that because they just – and I, I uh, totally understand because so many of us, you know, we, we think the best of folks and, and think, well, this is documentation for my car. I'll keep it in the car. Not thinking ahead that if somebody breaks into your car, gets that title, then they can forge like a sale. And then it becomes like a really complicated matter of trying to prove I didn't do that sale to that person who stole my car because um, they can forge signatures and, and whatnot. Um, so yeah, uh, every now and then we'll see where they steal registrations. But my, my personal theory on that is that uh, a lot of thieves aren't exactly the most intelligent. And they see registration paper and go, ooh, I think I can do something with this. And they can't. Um, so there's that too. Uh, so yeah, if, as long as you're not leaving anything worth taking in your car, and if they get in your car, I can say, I can also say this because I was a victim of this back when I used to have a Jeep and you, you can't lock it up. Uh, every now and then I'd come out and, and my console would be open and stuff would be strewn all over the place. And you definitely feel violated because somebody has been in your personal property, in your personal space. But if there was nothing to take, at least you're not a victim of a loss. Uh, you still have to deal with the fact that somebody was in your car and it, it makes you feel sick. Uh, and I, I say that from personal experience. Um, so again, if, if you make that choice on your own to go, Hey, I'm just going to leave my car unlocked because I don't want my window busted out. I don't want to buy new windows. Um, we get it. I mean, we're, we're not going to fault you for that. Um, and then, yeah, the last category was actual vehicle theft. One of them, they had the key left inside. Uh, one of them, they weren't sure how it was stolen said, you know, there weren't keys inside. Not it, it's, uh, that's all unknown. The other one's one of those where, um, the victim let a friend, but they don't know the friend's full name, uh, borrow their car, and then the friend never brought it back. Um, so that, that vehicle was stolen in that manner. So definitely know who you loan your car out is the, the learning point on, on that case. And then the other one is, yes, yeah, certainly. Oftentimes we have like a valet key, <clears throat> and folks will just leave that in the glove box. Don't. Please, please, please don't, because it, it makes uh, an easy target for the, the car being taken. Are the break-ins um, cars that don't have alarms, or are they just, the alarms are going off anyway? Well, so, so many of them, because they're not locked, the mm -hmm. alarm's not triggered. Like in, in your neighborhood, you had five total cases, only one of them was forced entry. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing in the report to indicate if they heard the alarm. Um, 
but when four out of five, there was no evidence of forced entry, and and the reports made by a victim who said, hey, my car is broken into, but we didn't get called because an alarm was going off at two o'clock in the morning. One could make the assumption that either uh, they just didn't lock it or they forgot to lock it. And and I will say this, because oftentimes when, when I bring that point up, folks will get mad and go, well, are you blaming the victim? And I'm real quick to say, look, I've been doing this almost 20 years, and I've been talking to neighborhoods as the community coordinator now since – well, seven years. How many times have you heard me talk about lock your car, lock your car and all that? I still forget. You know, I, my, uh, my dad would always pick my kids up from school and um, I'd come home and because and, he'd be watching my kids. And when he'd go to leave, he'd go outside and come back in the house and go, hey, Mike, you forgot to lock your car again. And I'd just be like, ah. And, and I preach this over and over and over and half for years. But how many times we come home and we got groceries or we're carrying, you know, our briefcase and this and that from the car to the house. And uh, so, so yeah, I'm not blaming folks. It's just one of those things I want to keep reminding just as good advice. Um, so yeah, that's, that's your uh, total crime data. Does anybody have any questions for me? So, so Sergeant, um, are you noticing a particular trend in the type of car or the age of the car? Not that tends to make them more prevalent to be stolen as opposed to no, a different if, model or a different age? If you, uh, if you look at a lot of the uh, social media pages, so many people are sending uh, or posting or sending us like Ring and Nest and Arlo camera footage. The folks that do this are predominantly juveniles and they just walk through the neighborhoods checking door handles. And if there's one unlocked, doesn't matter if it's new, old, make model none of that matters if it's unlocked then they're inside um but as far as the vehicle thefts are the thefts typically older model cars nope. that are easy to hotwire or no I'm so just trying to figure out right so you you definitely hot wiring cars is a thing of the past if you've got like an older and when i say older older domestic yeah you can still pop a column and uh and, and drive off in those. I, I remember when I did work auto theft, the old Hondas, especially Accords, you could take a screwdriver, cram it into the ignition like it was a key, and then you could just turn the screwdriver like it was a key. Uh, so that was a design flaw. Um, but I just read an email today that's the, our PIO's office that puts out just data for the public. Somewhere just a little under 70% of the stolen cars over the last week in all of Davidson County had keys inside the car. So that's, that's the overwhelming uh, reason why cars are getting stolen is because there's a key in it. Or it's the, the cases of I'm just going to run in the store just for, a, just for a minute and go you know get a pack of cigarettes or go grab whatever. And so they park in front of the, the store with it running dart inside and uh i'm telling you that's bad guy uber uh the, yeah. the their, their ride just just showed up and they're going to jump in and they're going to drive it across town and ditch it so so generally speaking those cars that are stolen from say someone's driveway or their alley access the, the pad that they're sitting on typically tends to be cars that may have had valet keys left in them or 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 the general yeah. keys like you're keyless and you just forget that you left them in the cup holder right that type of thing Right, exactly. Okay, that's good to know because that's one of the one of the things that I had been thinking about over the last month or so is how are these new cars being stolen? Because we've got one that's a 2017, and you walk away from it with a key and with a key in your pocket, and there's not a bloody thing you can do to to start right. that car up and move it. Right. But if you leave the key in the cup holder, it's a whole different ball game. Exactly. What was okay. the uh, what was the date of the uh, robbery on the fourteen hundred block of Meridian? Uh, stand by. I'll give you a date and a time. So that robbery, I gotta put my glasses back on. <laughs> that one was on July twentieth, and actually it was in the morning between nine and nine thirty. All right. Thank you. Uh huh. Anything else? Yeah, Mike. Um, uh, has anybody done a wellness check recently on Margaret and Pat? 
Uh, so they, they every now and then drop into the precinct to, they'll fill up water jugs. Cause I've talked to them over and over about coming to get water, but you know what? I have not seen them in a while. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've been in touch with them. You know, I see them every couple of weeks or so. Um, you know, they come over, do laundry or, you know, they came over the other day and needed money for dog and cat food. Um, Pat, you know, Pat's not working anymore. I and Margaret's working a lot. So I just, you know, maybe a wellness check. Cause you, um, kind of look in and see how they're doing yeah I so if i could make if i can make mention um ray i actually spoke with them a couple of times last week and have given them permission to um uh, drop by my house and actually i set up a guest network on my wi-fi for them so that they could uh, use some wi-fi um oh, that's they're great. doing pretty good um, yeah they need a phone a, i know that they need a phone that's been the yeah, thing. yeah 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 and they're working on getting that restored. Um, and then, of course, I've, I've talked to them about doing some odd jobs around my house and paying them for the work that they're doing. So mm-hmm. um, that's, a, uh, that's a good thing. They are, um, they are out there, but they've been doing well. Um, I've not had, you know, they've not had any kind of issues or anything that I'm aware of. I visited with them several times last week before I left. Um, yeah. yeah well, Mike, you so they're, one, they're doing pretty good. Yeah, I just wanted Mike to know you did a wonderful thing for Margaret because she had talked about that project that she wanted involved in a couple or so years ago. And I told her to talk to you and, you know, you just made that happen for her. And it it really changed her personally, you know, and the way that she saw herself and interacted. So it was. Yeah, it she, was she keeps talking about her involvement with that project now. And yeah. she's been very, very good with it. And just for those that are on the call that don't know, um, Pat and Margaret are a couple of folks that live in our neighborhood. They actually consider themselves off-grid, not necessarily homeless, um, but they're the two very good souls that uh, that come down and, and help with some of the projects at Trinity Community Commons um, and such. And they're they're uh, very good contributors to our neighborhood. So if if uh, either of you have any contact with them before I do, just remind them we still get the food pantry there at East Precinct. Uh, okay. past, I've given them like toiletries and, and different uh, food items that they can take back to their camp. Yeah, I think what they what they need on a regular basis, it, you know, that they ask me a lot about and I try to do anytime I can. Usually they call me and I'm out of town, but they need ice a lot, particularly in the summer, you know, just to have a, a way to replenish their ice. Thank right. So, so ice we don't have in our food pantry only because we don't have a big freezer. But yeah. um, I've been I've been able to give them uh, food in the past. But oh, uh, I know, I know. They're no, they they're not they're not hungry and they're not. But it just you know um, they start making gains about moving towards shelter and then it just you know shit happens. <laughs> like they they do like have pandemic from what I understand. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, from what I understand, there is a church that they attend that has helped them out with ice, with ice excuse me, um, every week, generally on Sundays. Um, I've given them a ride a couple of times to pick up ice. Um, okay. They've had a couple of other folks. So, you know, they're Yeah, no, they're they've got a network. They've covered. got a network that's, you know, but I hadn't seen them. And, you know, I think I saw they were here last week. Or uh, Pat was. Margaret wasn't. All right. Well, thanks anyway. And, Mike, you did a good job. Thanks. We all be good. Uh, just don't forget. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. There's just a couple of questions in the chat, um, Sarge. About um, so one question was asked: Are you seeing an increase in stolen cars parked within neighborhoods and private property? And then, are you seeing an increase in stolen cars parked within neighborhoods? Well, it was the same question. Um, so apparently, that person uh, was asking if we've seen any increase specifically uh, on private property, or have these some of these stolen cars been just in general areas like you were talking about leaving cars running at uh, convenience stores and such. so the, the vast majority and this is from a historical standpoint and it's a consistent is uh cars stolen out of driveways private property only because and, and again i think this goes back to our theory that it's it's one of those you've got all these folks out there checking door handles to get into cars see if they can find money computers a lot of guns. I think we've had like 50 some guns stolen out of cars in East Nashville this year, which is ridiculous. Um, but as, as they're rummaging through these cars, they're finding the keys. And then they're like, eh, let's go take a ride. And we'll go through some cars in another neighborhood. 
So, so yeah, that's, that's a consistent that we see a lot of the cars taken that way. I have a few things. Um, what was, I was wondering if you could give some more details briefly about the East Precinct food pantry. Like what are the days or hours that we could pass along to people? So the, the idea behind our food pantry is it's not like, um, it's not like a consistent program where families can come by every week and just and get food. We've, we've got like a limited, limited stock, but the way we use that typically is when officers are out in the field, like uh, one example is something I did. I was driving down Dickerson and man, this pickup truck blew my doors off and I don't do a lot of traffic enforcement, but this guy blew my doors off <laughs> going down Dickerson. So because I drive an unmarked Camry, I'm an admin sergeant. I don't need like a real police car, but it still has lights and sirens. So I pulled him over. Turns out he's homeless. Uh, his girlfriend was in the car, he's an older couple. And uh, I was like, buddy, you know, what's, what's the rush? Because you're going at a pretty good clip. And he's like, I'm trying to get downtown. I'm sorry. We we're going to go to this, this place. It's supposed to give out food. We've never been there. And I was like, oh, psh, I got you. Follow me to the precinct. And that's the idea is when we run into people in the field that are in immediate need, we can take them to the precinct. We'll grab a box, you know, one of the boxes that all of our printer paper comes in or something. And we'll just fill it up with canned goods, rice, you know, dry goods, toiletries, whatever they need and send them on their way. How is that replenished? Uh, it was donations. So okay. the, the stock we got right now is one of the area churches. Uh, it brought us like a, a whole bunch of uh, canned goods, dry goods, toiletries. And uh, uh, so, yeah, and, and the officers use that pretty consistently. When you, we could go out on a call and somebody had a bicycle stolen, but we get out there on the, on the scene and we go, oh, man, this family is, they're struggling. And you, you kind of diplomatically ask, hey, are you guys doing okay when it comes to food and whatnot? And you kind of get the indication that, that they aren't. So we're like, stand by you get on the radio and go hey will somebody put a, a box together and we'll pack it up and bring it to them it's you know we're not we're not equipped to be like second harvest where the same folks could keep coming in like every week um right. but it's it's kind of an emergency food bank and uh so yeah the officers like to be able to use that when when they're out just doing their business but recognize oh man this this is a situation where we can kind of step in a little further and not just take a crime report or uh, in my case, not write a ticket, but let me give you a box of uh, all kinds of food and, and, and help out that way. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, speaking of speeding, <laughs> uh, we've had some neighbors like bring up that I, I've witnessed lots of speeding on Lishy lately, but Meridian has also come up in previous like meetings and discussions on our like Facebook page. Uh -huh. um, I was wondering, can, is there any way to have like, Re like request patrols if there's some downtime or something just because I'm seeing it midday like right sometimes it's just a little speeding but sometimes it's on a whole different level right um so, so yeah the the quick easy answer to that is I know a guy um <laughs> over there at East Precinct that Sergeant Fisher fella uh okay yeah I, I think I've heard of him yeah so what I'll do is I will send that out to the all three shift lieutenants, day, evening, and uh, midnight. So just go, hey, uh, talk to Highland Heights. And the folks there said we'd like some extra speed enforcement. Day shift, we do have a motorcycle officer. That that's all he does is traffic enforcement. I will have him go over and hit Lishy and Meridian during the day. Yeah, even if it's and speaking of motorcycles. To kind of remind people, because right. I think it's just a free-for-all a little bit over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've had some motorcycle um, speeding up and down, Lish, or Jones as well, um, that we hear from time to time. And okay. I know the Chandlers were, um, of course, very focused on Meridian as well. Yeah, well, I, you know. Yeah, there was, yeah, some definite concerns expressed. What's uh, frustrating for us is that it does not matter what overall crime data looks like. I mean, you could, you could have a whole bunch of robberies or you'd have this and that. Without a doubt, my most consistent complaint is speeding and parking for East National. Um, so I get a lot of requests for extra traffic enforcement. And I, every time I get them, I send them out to the patrol supervisors and, 
And that's exactly right. And in, in between calls for service and downtime, those zone officers know here are the hot spots for speeding and can go out and, and check an eye on it. Great. And I, I do have one last thing, um, not to monopolize you, but um, this is outside like Highland Heights, but just on like the Facebook pages and the neighborhood watch, it seems like there's been like some weird trends of uh, like harassing women either from like people in vehicles or like, I know there was somebody on the Greenway in Shelby last week. Is so that, that guy got charged. He was okay. identified. Then there was the big blow up uh, all over social media about the van. It was like a navy blue van with a gold uh, hood. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I've actually personally been working on that because I got so many emails and here's what I can say publicly. Okay. I feel like from the contacts I have in the community and the folks who have been able to give me information uh, and, and the cooperation that we've got with the sex crime unit, I've got a very strong feeling that that's going to come to a conclusion soon. Um, so folks, folks gave me a lot of really good information and, and that's not me doing police work. That's me sitting at my desk and going through a whole bunch of emails and phone calls and giving it to the right detectives. Um, that's good. I'm, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just a good facilitator. Uh, so the detective I'm working with in sex crimes, who's been outstanding, uh, and, and very responsive to the information that I've been passing over to him. I, I feel like I'm, I'm very hopeful that's going to come to a conclusion soon. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I can say publicly right now. Is there any general advice that we should be thinking about just to, if, I mean, are we seeing a spike in that sort of thing or is this very like isolated incidences? So any general advice would be welcome. Here, here's the best advice I can give you. The, the Shelby Park case is a perfect example in that when that was posted in social media, there was a whole bunch of people that said, hey, that's, I, I've seen that too. I've been a victim of that too. But we had one report to us. So people are really quick to talk about it in social media. But the, what's, what's very frustrating for us is we need to be a part of that conversation. And had those things not been forwarded to me, or I hadn't gotten a, a handful of emails of folks go, hey, did you see this in social media? So then I had to kind of circle back to social media to, to call this stuff. Best advice I can give you, even if it's just a, a suspicion and, and not like an outright crime, call us and let us know. Or even if you just email me, to let me know so I can start pointing assets in that direction. It seems that so often folks are real quick to talk about crimes and social media, but they never call the police um, to cue us in on it. Like I, you know, I've seen uh, posts about, hey, I saw that van the other day in such and such neighborhood, but I couldn't find anything in our dispatch reports where they picked up the phone and said, hey, that van they're talking about is driving around over here in this neighborhood. We need to know. So, so the, the, the key takeaway in that situation is at the very least call the non-emergency number. Absolutely. To report the incident. And then secondly, um, reach out to you directly, either by tagging you in a social media or sending you an email or something so that you are given a heads up. Right. And you can pass it along to the appropriate folks. Right. So you def definitely call the dispatch center first because, um, I'm certainly not on social media 24 seven. And oftentimes, you know, I'll come in on a Monday and that's exactly what happened with that particular case. I came in this past Monday and my email and voicemail was blowing up and I was going, Oh man. And I feel bad, you know, because all of a sudden I'm getting like this deluge of information, but I'm not the police on Saturday and Sunday, you know? Uh, so it, it, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the fact that folks send me information. I just ask that folks call the, the dispatch center first and then follow up, send, send stuff to me too, because I guarantee you, you know, you send me an email, you send me a voicemail, whatever. I'm going to follow up. I'm going to make sure the appropriate uh, resources within the department know this information. It is exactly what I did with this van. Um, but it, I, I think that's a really exigent circumstance where you, it definitely necessitates a call to the dispatch center and going, hey, there's a predator down here in the park. 
and uh, we need we need officers out here quick. Thank I, so, you. just for those for those folks that are on the call or on this um, Zoom meeting, can you right quickly repeat your e email address so that they have a way to get a hold of you? Absolutely. So, again, I'm Michael Fisher. Uh, common spelling. It's going to be M I C H A E L dot Fisher F I S H E R at Nashville dot gov. Um, if you didn't get that, if you go to the uh, the Metro Police website and click on East Precinct, over to the right side of the page, they've got all the administrative staff. I'm the community coordinator. My email is linked there. Uh, if you use Facebook. I, I try to get on there at least once a day, Monday through Friday. If you fire a message to the East Precinct page, I'm the one who monitors that so I can check the messages on it. Uh, so you've got a handful of, oh, there you go. Court, good job, Courtney. She just sent my email out as a message to everybody. She knows what she's doing. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of different channels to get a hold of me. Um, I also have a work cell phone number. If you want to copy this down, it's 615. 788-7779. Uh, and I'll answer that during work hours. Uh, if it's after work hours, just fire me a text or call it after work hours and leave a voicemail. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to uh, respond to that the next day too. Fantastic. Did anybody else have any other quick questions for the Sergeant? before we let him go attend the next meeting he has to go to tonight. Thank you. Ray, did you have something or was that just a how you doing kind of wave? Okay, okay. all right. My, cool. my only uh, last parting request is because, Gordon, since you're down there on the beach by a pool, um, I, I would like really appreciate it that if in my honor you would have a really fancy drink that was uh, had like umbrellas in it and, and stuff like that. Uh, before the end of the day, I'd, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> well, considering that, that the people that usually have a few drinks at the pool, umbrellas might be a choking hazard, but uh, I'll, 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 definitely, uh, I'll definitely honor that request for you. And if you'd like, I can certainly take a picture and tag you in it just so that, uh, you know, that even in Cancun, right. we are greatly appreciative of everything you do for our neighborhood. <laughs> You got it. So you guys be safe. It's always good seeing you. I cannot wait till we can all hang out in person again. Uh, so uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks, Sarge. I appreciate you dropping in. See ya. All righty, ladies and gentlemen. So that's, um, that's our monthly report from Metro Police and from our um, neighborhood liaison or, or um, uh, local sergeant to help out. Um, take a moment and I want to introduce and at least welcome a couple of new folks to our group, the Chandlers, um, Paula, and I'm trying to think of who else is new this, this week. Uh, we've got 14 or 15 people on board, but most of them looks like, oh, Gerald, um, welcome to the, the call. So um, moving right along, and, and if any of you folks want to say hi to everybody, please let me know. Um, but uh, just want to let you know that uh, the minutes from last month, actually, Linda just sent them to me uh, about an hour and a half, two hours ago. And I have to admit, I was down at the pool having a couple of drinks, so I didn't see them come in. So I didn't have a chance to save them a PDF and post them. I will take care of that later on tonight. Um, the July meeting is posted on our YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and watch the entire meeting, you certainly can. Um, Moving right along in the agenda, treasury report is unchanged from last month. Uh, we will have about a $60 expenditure to pay for our PO box rental come and do this month. I'll take care of that once I get back into Nashville. Um, so last I looked, forgive me, 1658 seems to be the number that I'm remembering. So in the ballpark of $1,600 still remaining in our account, less than $60 I'll pay on the post office box rental. So we're still maintaining right there. Uh, Don, are you still on the line with us? Don was in earlier. Don Tangren, are you still there? I don't see him in the list. So I apologize. He may have dropped the call or what, wasn't able to stay on. Um, but I do know that with Don like in the community garden. He was having garden, trouble with audio. Was he? Okay. All right. Um, I know that they are looking at doing 
uh, honey extraction event, he may be still looking for a venue to hold that at. Um, and of course, because of the coronavirus concern and such, they may have to do it in a different place than, than they have in the past. Um, but just so you know that at our community garden, as well as several locations around our neighborhood, there are several beehives and that um, they do a honey extraction every year. This year is gonna be a much lighter harvest because of all the dry weather earlier on in the season, but he still wants to try to make um, something of a, an event around the extraction because it is a pretty cool experience. You know, Courtney was there a couple of years ago covered in honey. Um, it, it was quite an experience overall. <laughs> But uh, just keep a look at our Facebook page. I think he tries to uh, post on there from time to time to s just to see what, uh, what we can do. Um, moving right along on the agenda, um, zoning and planning. There, we did have someone, uh, Gerald Flint, from, um, uh, who is connected with 302 Edwin Street. Um, that is a property that has uh, recently been sold and the new owner wants to do um, an a zoning change from RS5 to R6A. Um, Gerald, are you still on the line with us? I believe I saw you earlier. Uh, yes, yes, I'm here. Hello, everybody. Fantastic. So um, if you would like to take a couple of moments, tell us what's going on with the property, what you guys want to do. Um, I will say that I think this is easily within the scope of the, the neighborhood uh, supplemental policy and such, but just in the, um, in the interest of being transparent with everybody, um, I believe you wanted to come in and just talk about what, what the general plans are for the property. So I'll yeah. yield the floor to you and, you know, All right. um, there you go. All right. Awesome. Hello, everybody. My name is Jarrell Flint. I'm with JDD Properties. Uh, my colleague Ashanti Davis is also uh, on the line. Um, essentially, uh, 302 Edwin um, is a vacant property. Um, it had a property on it. I think that eventually became dilapidated uh, some time ago. Uh, what we're looking to do with the property is put uh, two duplexes on it um, that will complement the existing, I guess, kind of look of the neighborhood. We can put three properties, but we don't want to, you know, I guess get greedy with the 0.37 acres uh, of lot. Um, there is a... Um, I guess a trailer park or SP behind it. And there's a plan to build an alley um, that's going to help us out tremendously because we'd like to backload the parking um, and use that alley. Um, and essentially, um, again, we just want to keep the existing, I guess, integrity of the neighborhood. It's, it's not going to be tall and skinny. They're going to just look like single family homes, but they'll be duplexes. Okay. And I'm understanding that these are going to also not be short term rental eligible. You're going to write that into, well, it's is in an R6, so it, you know would not automatically fall into that particular um, uh, possible use. Um, but these are going to be two physical structures with two units each structure, correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. And um, if I'm not mistaken, isn't this property about a hundred foot street frontage? Is that correct? Okay. So it's, it's wider than a typical street. So it, it will look more akin to, there's a um, single structure, two duplex or two units in a, similar to that on like the 1700 block of Blishy. So it's gonna be similar to, to that particular structure, correct? Yes, yeah, Ashanti, with that, is that correct? I know she has the pictures. I, I don't know how to present them, but. Well, that's okay. So does anybody have any questions yes, or concerns? Correct about this particular property and what they're looking to do with it. Uh, like I said, this particular section of Edwin is actually potentially much heavier density than what they're wanting to do. So it would easily fall within um, the neighborhood supplemental policies that we have. So I uh, just want to open the floor and let anybody that, if anybody should have any questions or concerns, please, this is the opportunity to raise them. Well, that's really exciting that, you know, I I know you, Ashanti, and I know how um, committed you are to, you know, the whole idea of um, growing in a way that allows um, affordable housing and stuff. And I was, that's, my question is, are, is what's going to be there affordable and is, is it accessible to maybe people that have, um, you know, need um, access to their accessible housing? Oh. 
Was was that was that question directed at Ashanti? Or you? Yeah, either one. Either one. I, I think just Ashanti's wondered... talking, but she's on mute. Oh, is she? She is talking. I was on mute. I am talking oh. on mute. Thank you. That doesn't um, happen very often now, does it? <laughs> Never, really. Uh, Ray, to answer your question, um, to be honest, I don't know about the affordability factor, but um, as many of you know, I've been on the 300 block of Edwin for the last, I don't know, almost 30 years. And um, my mom and my sister both live across the street from this vacant lot. Um, so they're very, um, they had a lot of input on what they wanted to see. So, um, the goal was just so that the vacant lot wouldn't continue just to sit and collect dust essentially and people who dump to prevent Jarrell and I from having to go clean that up once a month. Um, it'll like to, what to Stacy said, it'll look to scale like 1708. So it'll be to scale to like most of the homes that are currently on this block. Okay. Um, and it's a step down in density, um, considering across the street, you have the blue duplexes that face Meridian, one of them faces Edwin. And then as Jarrell mentioned, the current under construction is the Meridian Mobile Home Park SP. So um, I think the best way to describe this project is a balance between the new and the old. Um, you know, right. this block still pretty much looks like it did, but there are a lot of new builds and there's a lot of construction going on around it. So. Um, the goal is, though, for the property owner with the additional unit, um, that'll defray a lot of the infrastructure costs because new water lines and sidewalks and all that stuff will have to be put in. And so by adding one additional unit than what the property currently allows, um, you can come in at like a more affordable price point. So. Okay, thanks a lot. There's a question in the chat box about how large the homes will be. Do you guys have any ideas about like the square footage for each um, building? And I was curious about the setback. So the setbacks will be, to answer your setback question first, the setbacks will be within the setbacks that are allowed by the RS6 zoning, which is the same as RS5. So I think if I'm remembering correctly, you have to be 20 feet from the street and then um, they'll have to be 20 feet from the alley and then five feet from your neighbor. So those are just the normal setbacks. There won't be any exceptions on the setbacks, just currently what's allowed. And then, um, so because the lot, the lot is about 16,454 square feet um, subdivided, that means you have about an 8,000 square foot lot for each unit or home essentially. Um, and we're not going to ask for, the plan is not to ask for any exceptions on the setbacks. So it's hard to say how large the homes will be at this point, but whatever is allowed within that building envelope. So sort of, it's, it's hard to say, but just to, as a point of reference, and I, it's, I don't know how to present the pictures, but sort of like what 1708 looks like. So you're probably looking at anywhere between an 1800 to 2200 square foot home. So the thing to, the important thing to remember, this is a hundred foot frontage. So the it's typical lot. lot, yeah, the typical lot in our neighborhood is 50 foot wide. And if you go down, say, Stainback or Pinnock or some of the others where they've had tall skinnies, most of those lots are 25 foot. So if, if you look at taking that hundred, hundred foot frontage, dividing it in half, putting a single structure, the, the, look as you go down the street is going to be similar to single home, single home, single home. Even though each one of these two structures is going to house two units each, two families each, the perception is a single family home environment, um, which if this were a much skinnier lot or a different type of lot that they were wanting to rezone R6 or R6A, it would be a concern um, in, in most of the streets in our neighborhood. But since this particular area is actually uh, under the supplemental policy could support a much heavier density, we're actually quite good that, that, that the density is not gonna be so high. And it will look akin to other homes and lots in this, in this area, if that makes sense. So if that helps 
paint the picture a little better. I hope it does. Yeah, it sounds great. It does sound well within the scope and uh, just very nice. So. And Stacy, thanks for that explanation. It was very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Does anybody else have any questions for um, Darrell or, or Ashanti on what they're looking to do with this particular property? Uh, you know, now, like I said, is the time to speak up and and ask questions because we do have the benefit of them actually being on the call with us. Um, as I said, with R6A, there's no possibility of short-term rentals. Um, you know, it's it's single-family residence still considered, even though it would be multifamily to a point, but it's still considered single family residence structures. Um, if you have any questions, now's the time. If not, then, you know, uh, unless somebody speaks up in just a moment, we'll move ahead. With and Stacey, can I mention one thing? Certainly. Um, one thing I just want to mention so that everybody knows, um, Jarrell Flint, um, he filed the application like a week or two ago and the tentative date that they have set for this is for before the planning commission is September 24th. So in case you're outside of the notice area, I just wanted people to know that that's the date that has been tentatively set is September 24th. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. All right, if there are no other questions for them on that particular property and, and the planning issue, um, we'll move on to a couple of things. New business wise, we do have a YouTube channel. Um, these meetings are posted up on YouTube and uh, this one will probably take a little while because I can't do the type of edit I need to do from from where I am presently not saying that uh, that it's not possible it's just I don't have the equipment with me to do it um, so it'll probably be next week or so before we actually get the uh, um, the meeting from tonight posted on the YouTube channel but it will be um, shared in Facebook so that you actually have it um, we are still looking for ideas on how to improve community engagement. So if anyone has any ideas they want to share with me or anybody else in the steering committee, please feel free to let us know because um, one of our main goals is to try to engage more people. Uh, it's a good thing that, uh, that Paula and the Chandlers are here with us because they are new to um, the Highland Heights neighborhood area and I greatly appreciate them joining us on this particular meeting. I, think that we are making some good headway in improving the overall um, communication with the neighborhood and engagement, but we can always use improvements. There's never any, any slowing down in that particular instance. Um, I listened so to the last, that, sorry, I oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Meeting that was on YouTube and you guys talked about magnets that you'd ordered a bunch of and then there yeah. haven't been any events. Can you put those on mailboxes and just kind of so, just around? So we, we, we have to make sure that we don't violate any of the Postal Service rules. We can't put them in mailboxes. We could try to put them on the outside of mailboxes, but the magnets really are not very strong. So we want to make sure that there's not a possibility of them falling off and getting lost. Um, the plan had been that as we had more meetings in general, uh, in person, we had ordered these right before COVID became a big issue. Um, the intention was that we were going to pass them out at meetings and pass them out at different uh, community events that we had planned. We typically try to have um, a fall event where um, prior to school starting that, that we try to you know, get people together, have a cookout, that type of thing. Um, of course, all of those plans were pretty much eradicated because of the circumstance that we're in now. So we do have about 1,500 of these magnets in the plans are to kind of distribute them. I know Courtney had wanted to get a couple and I haven't had a chance to get by her house, but um, you know, there are um, plenty of opportunities for us to do that. And it just, it's real simple. It just has um, our main email address for the chairperson, the Facebook group um, location. And um, what else do we have? I think Courtney did, I can't recall what we had. Oh, the fact that we have a third meeting every third, or a meeting every third Thursday at Trinity Commons which we haven't had since COVID started. So, yeah, it is what it is. Um, I do think that's a, a great idea though. And Paula, if you'd like some magnets to distribute even to the neighbors like near, near you, like you would be more than welcome to pick some up. Certainly. Um, I, you know, just shoot me an email or tag me on Facebook and, and I'll get some over to you. Um, it was just a simple way. We had debated using yard signs as opposed to um, something a little more widespread. 
that the yard signs can sometimes be blocked by cars on the street or by foliage or whatever. So we, we decided to go this particular route because it was a little less expensive than doing a bunch of yard signs. Uh, and it was a little more personal too. So like I said, great plans were waylaid by the virus and such. Okay. Um, on the note of yard signs, just briefly, if anybody happens to have one of the mini yard signs that announces the meeting, I have a little like printout that I've sized to patch over for just the meantime, like with some tape that says to go to like the Facebook or next door for the meeting link. So if anybody has one of those small signs, just shoot me an email and I'll send you a little like sheet that you could print and put over it or I can print it. Send okay. me one, Courtney. This is Ray. Okay, awesome. Perfect. So, did anybody else have any questions or comments or ideas for increasing our engagement within the community? If so, let me know. It doesn't have to be at this moment. You know, I'm always open to people calling me or emailing me. Um, I'm pretty much a 24 hour focused on the neighborhood kind of guy, or else I would not be zooming in uh, from Cancun. <laughs> Not to make you jealous or anything. Um, so that being said, um, we do before we do a quick roundtable. Um, I do want to let you guys know we have been working on the Planning Academy that Neighbor to Neighbor is sponsoring. Um, just to give you guys a quick update on what this is, uh, it is going to be an introduction to planning and development. Um, uh, another opportunity to give you guys a better insight into the planning process within our city, uh, a, a better insight to the development um, plans that are that are going on, how to engage with the planning community, um, both the commission and with developers in order to influence you know, things that go on in our neighborhood. Basically, some of the knowledge that, that several of us in our neighborhood have garnered over the past couple of years dealing with these issues. Um, neighbor to Neighbor is an association that um, spans the city and they work with a bunch of different neighborhoods. Um, and one of the ideas that came out of what we had to do a couple of years ago with our neighborhood um, was we wanted to find a way to improve that knowledge, that communication and help people actually be more engaged in the process. After we did about a year long um, think tank on ways to make this work, out of that came the Planning Academy and it is scheduled to launch in October. Um, I will be one of the facilitators working on that particular project. At this point, because of COVID, because of social distancing and such, there are only going to be eight people allowed for the first class. Um, that will be launched on September 1st, as far as the, the sign up and the registration. And the way we'll have to do it is the first eight people to register will be the first eight people that will be granted. Um, first dibs on a seat in the academy. The plan is that um, the planning academy will have at least four to five sessions per year. And as we progress in our sessions, we'll have more people attend per session. Um, but there's a lot more to it than, than just one night. Uh, it's typically four weekends within a month long period. Um, of course, if anybody has questions, please let me know. Um, I will post when those are um, <clears throat> the official place to register to request a slot, um, there it will be a charge, but it will be slated or it will be tiered based on what you're afford what you can personally afford to pay. Uh, I will say this: that um, while I haven't mentioned this to any of the steering committee, we haven't officially voted on it. But my intention is that if anybody from Highland Heights wants to attend this planning academy, we will underwrite the costs. Uh, if the steering committee as a whole decides that's not the best idea, I will personally underwrite the costs for you guys to attend. So, you know, it's a very important academy. If anybody has any questions, let me know. Or if you want to ask them now, you certainly can. But um, uh, that's something that I know a few folks in our neighborhood have been waiting for. Um, and we've been working on it for a while. But we're much closer now to actually getting it started. Did Stacey, anybody have there? any questions? Yeah. Hey, Stacy. Is yes, there sir. somewhere we can find more information about that academy? Um, right now, um, neighbor to neighbors website 
only has very basic information on it. We, we literally had uh, an orientation for those of us who are going to be facilitators. Um, over the next couple of weeks, more information will be coming out and I will certainly keep people posted. So what I can say is just watch our Facebook group because if whenever there's an update, I will post the information out there. Um, with a limited number of seats, there's been a lot of demand for this and neighborhood neighbors decided that first come first serve as far as the registrations are gonna be the best thing they can do at this point because they literally have to social distance in the classes and it's, they don't have enough space to do a tremendous number of those. But Ben, of course, at any point in time, certainly feel free to reach out to me or Courtney if you've got any questions on development in the neighborhood because we've been so involved in it over the past few years. Um, if you've got any specific questions, let us know. Great, thanks. Does that make sense? I have to double check because sometimes, you know, after pool time, I just want to yeah, try and making sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Courtney just yes. talked about neighbor to neighbor um, focus groups that are happening right now and there's one on development yep. that's next Thursday so um, Ben that's like a intro level I think and also you get to be interactive which is cool yeah and they've also been working on transit um, they're wanting to get feedback from people on transit um, issues and concerns they are very well connected with a lot of things going on in the city and they are a very good sounding board uh, I know a lot of Metro Council people, especially during our Think, think Tank, um, there were a lot of Metro Council folks that came and listened to what we were saying um, during that, that nine months of um, ironing out some of the, the concerns that we had with planning and development in general. Okay. Um, yeah, I did one. I shared a little, I tried to do a screenshot and that didn't work very well. So um, I made a list of some of the focus groups that their neighbor to neighbor is hosting recently uh, or upcoming. And I think we just passed one a little bit earlier this evening. Um, but if you are interested in any of those topics, I would invite you to like join the call and I would get that information to you about what date and how to sign up. Um, but I'm sure you can also sign up through their website as well. Uh, but there's a bunch of really great topics. I think they surveyed a lot of neighbors and I, I identified like lots of different passionate things I'm passionate about in the topic. So if you're drawn to one of them, I know they're developing programming, I think following some of these focus groups. So um, yeah, join if you can and stay tuned because I'm sure they'll have much more programming on all the topics in the future. And I will say this, one of the things that I found most interesting and one of the key takeaways I took from meeting with um, the think tank that as we first got started with it a couple of years ago was that a lot of the issues and concerns that we have in Highland Heights, it's amazing how many other neighborhoods across our city and there are literally, you know, close to a hundred different neighborhoods. Um, how many of those neighborhoods actually have a lot of the same issues and concerns? It's amazing to think that that we are our own little neighborhood, but a lot of the problems that we have and a lot of the challenges we have are echoed across the city. It's it's a pretty humbling thing to hear when people from places like Green Hills and Germantown and Antioch and and, and Caney Fork, they all have the same challenges. It's 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 it really is. Um, humbling to hear that. So um, that being said, and without wanting to keep people too much longer, I just wanted to give an opportunity for folks to round table right quick. And if there's anything that they want to bring to our attention, um, please, I'm going to open the floor to anybody that wants to make comments. If anybody has anything that they want to bring to the table um, to let us know that, that they'd like some help with, or they'd like to bring attention to the neighborhood group. Um, my pen and paper are ready to go. So I, I open the floor. Does anybody have anything that they want to bring to the attention of the neighborhood? Paula, you doing good? Rachel? Okay, Rachel. Um, well, I posted in the chat, but I think it got um, kind of scrolled by. I was thinking it would be nice if we just did a social event. Um, I know when we're here, we're all business for the hour and I'd love to get to know some people better. Um, we have a really lovely outdoor space at East Central Beer Works that's family friendly. Um, if anybody's interested in 
helping me organize a time that we could all just hang out and not talk about zoning. I would really love to get to know you guys in a different context. Also, I met Paula today at the Highland Heights Market. Jamie's doing great things over there. We have neighbors making bread and it's delicious. And I highly recommend you visit it every Thursday from 3.30 to 6. I bought a couple of things from over there. I bought some pickles and Chinese money plants. And what else did I have? Oh, um, pickled beets, which were gone in no time. So yeah, they, they did some pretty cool things over there. Well, and I, 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 I would. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, additionally, it is like food from neighbors to neighbors. So they're always looking for participants. If you are a gardener or a baker, I know that they would love to have your participation, um, even in providing goods that our neighbors are buying as well. So Rachel, to your point, um, I'll talk with the folks at East Nashville Beer Works because honestly, we have to be very cognizant of the social distancing is such that they have to keep in mind because I, I don't want a situation to, to happen where you know, they put their business in jeopardy by having you know, 40 or 50 of them show up at all at once. But um, I'd love, I mean, hell, I'm up for beer with any of you guys anytime. So, you know, it's not a problem. Um, but yeah, we'll look at that. That's certainly an idea. And, and we'll, we'll see what we can do for a social hour. Maybe there's a time of the week, maybe where they're not quite as busy. Although a couple of times I've driven past there, their parking lot seems to be packed. Um, but I'll see if there's something that they might have an idea for. Um, for time and, and, and date for us to get together. Does that work? Is that good? Okay, anybody else? Paula, did you have anything to bring to the table? Well, it's good to see you. Glad you were able to join us. Linda, are you doing good out there? All right, I can get a nod from her. Ben, you're all right? Nothing there? Okay. Ashanti, always good to see you. Um Thanks, Stacey. It's good to see you, too. I had one thing that I wanted to plug about the Dickerson Road North um, planning study. It's wrapping up. They're having a virtual meeting to sort of look in at what they've done on Tuesday, the 25th from 2 to 1. The link is on the planning website. And then they're going to do like an open house on September 1st. And then it's currently scheduled to be heard by the planning commission on September 24th. Um, we're not directly in the Dickerson North area, but the very edge of our neighborhood, which is Trinity and Dickerson Road, is the beginning point of that study. Um, and I think, and our policy is referenced a lot, so I just think it would be good for people to go look at the documents at Planning's website, weigh in if okay. there's anything that you want to say, because it always impacts us, so, because we're kind of in the middle. So I just wanted to plug that. Awesome. So, uh... Lady Chandler, it looks like your husband has dropped out of the camera view. <laughs> Did you have anything you needed to bring to the attention of the neighborhood? Oh, see, now he's back. All you got to do is evoke his name. You're muted, so I can't hear you. No, we're uh, we're good. We, uh, we've we come to one other meeting before, but we're going to try and be better about coming, and we appreciate all that y'all are doing. Fantastic. Thanks for attending tonight. You're always welcome, and uh, and we don't hold it against you if you have to miss a few. Marie, did you and Danny have anything to bring to the table? Nope, we're all good here. Fantastic. Saw a picture of Birdie the other day. She's growing by leaps and bounds. Um, yeah. So, Andrew Demolot, um, are you still in with us? I don't know if he dropped these. I am. I'm phone. actually. Oh, there yeah, he is. With, yeah, I am. I'm actually out and about with some work stuff. Sorry, we started back to school this week and last week too, so it's just been madness. Tell me about it. <laughs> but you're okay. You don't. Uh, do you have anything to bring to the neighborhood uh, neighborhood's attention or anything? Or uh, not right now. Just uh, happy to be here. I guess. Fantastic. Well, glad to have you join our meeting. Uh, this was a good turnout. I appreciate you guys tremendously. Um, so it is now 7.07. The meeting's been going on for an hour and five minutes. I did try to keep these to an hour, uh, unless anybody else has anything to bring to the attention of the neighborhood or bring up as new business. Um, I'm going to consider this um, uh, good. 
and we will adjourn this meeting. Anybody else? No? Nope. Good. Waves from everybody? All right, fantastic. Thank you all for attending. Have a great rest of the week. I'll be back in town on Sunday and uh, get this video posted as quick as I can. All right, y'all have a great afternoon. Good rest of the week. We'll talk to you soon. Uh, we're working on it. Enjoy your, enjoy your fun time down there. Oh, do you guys want one last view of the ocean? Oh. And, and such, just to take a look at it and the pools that are down It doesn't here. even look real. It's like a screensaver or something. Oh my God, the, the, the colors of the ocean this week have been fantastic. Honestly, the, the Facebook posts that we've been making, it just, it, it blows me away. I expect you to Danny, be in a different location every month now. <laughs> Don't challenge me. <laughs> All right, fantastic. I'll let you guys go. Have a good rest of the evening. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye, neighbors.